Hi, it's Andy from PCR Global with a video from our A to Z of risk management playlist. These videos are short enough not to induce boredom, but important enough to keep at the front of our minds and the tips of our tongues whilst we're on the front line of safety. Today's letter is C and the subject is corporate manslaughter. So the first place we're going to look at is a senior lecturer from the University of South Wales, Alexandra Dobson, talking about corporate manslaughter and corporate homicide. An area of law, of criminal law, that I'm particularly interested in is something called corporate manslaughter. And this is about companies' liability for death. And it can either be death of a member of the public or death of a member of the workforce. And it's an interesting and somewhat problematic area of the law because, of course, a corporate body doesn't have mens rea, it doesn't have the mental element that we would normally see in most criminal offences. Therefore, what we look at when we look at corporate manslaughter under what is called the Corporate Manslaughter and Corporate Homicide Act is collective responsibility, a jigsaw of liability, in other words. So interestingly, does not have mens rea. That means it does not have the intention to kill. And so what Alexander was saying is there, they look for that collective responsibility. It's sort of a jigsaw effect, as she was saying. Next place to look is the HSE website. There's always something on the HSE website. Let's have a look through it. Where can I find the Act and where can I find some guidance? So the Act is quite obviously on the actual internet there, as, as most, as all legislation is in the UK. But let's stick to the HSC website at the moment. When did it come into force? It actually came into force in 2008, although it was given royal assent in 2007. Are there any new duties or obligations under the Act? So were there any new, du act, new duties or obligations placed under the Act when it came out? No duties, okay, nor is the new offence part of health and safety law. It is, however, specifically linked to existing health and safety requirements. A lot of people think that the Act is actually health and safety law when it is not. What do companies and organisations need to do to comply? Companies and organisations that take their obligations under health and safety law seriously are not likely to be in breach of the new provisions. Nonetheless, companies and organisations should keep their health and safety management systems under review, in particular, the way in which their activities are managed or organised by senior management. There's a regulation, Regulation 5 of the management leg, uh, regulations, Plan, Manage, Organise, Control, Review, POC, Mr A, I think they're all in there, Manage and Organise management systems a lot of people diss management systems management systems give you a fantastic framework in my opinion who will investigate and prosecute under the law the police will investigate suspected cases of corporate manslaughter here's the interesting one Will directors, board members or other individuals be prosecuted this is what sets it apart the offence is concerned with corporate liability and does not apply to directors or under the individuals who have a senior role in the company or organisation. However, existing health and safety offences and gross negligence manslaughter will continue to apply to individuals. Prosecutions against individuals will continue to be taken when there is sufficient evidence and it is in the public interest to do so. So, what are we talking about here? The Corporate Homicide and Corporate Manslaughter, Corporate Manslaughter and Corporate Homicide Act 2007 does not concern individuals. It concerns the way in which the organisation's activities are managed or controlled. If we look at the Act, legislation, Corporate Manslaughter and Corporate Homicide Act, everything that we just read on the HSC website, that is actually in here as well when it breaks down the offence. Interestingly, gross breach. Let's have a look at eight factors for the jury to take into consideration factors for the jury 
The section applies where it is established that an organisation owed irrelevant duty of care to a person and it falls to the jury to decide whether there was a gross breach of that duty. The jury must consider whether the evidence shows that the organisation failed to comply with any health and safety legislation. It must so, if uh, sorry, how serious that failure was and how much of the risk to death it posed. The jury must also consider the extent to which the evidence shows there were attitudes, this is so important, policies, systems or accepted practices within the organisation that were likely to have encouraged any such failure. This is so important, attitudes, policies, this is why you know, a lot of people talk about paperwork, you know, not being on any use. We know that paperwork does not actually change the culture of an organisation, but it certainly does help if it's written well, if it's communicated well, and if it's available. It's not all about paperwork, of course. So where can we get some guidance on this? This document, really important document. I talk about it quite regularly. I advise quite often that we can use this document as a little bit of a toolbox talk. We can do a training session for senior management on this document, INDG417, Industry Guidance. Let's have a very quick look through it. It follows the Plan, Do, Check, Act, PD, PDCA approach. And I'm looking for a specific, a specific word in here. It, it, it explains throughout the document how we can use this as a handrail. It talks quite in depth about management systems. It gives us the costs of poor health and safety. It gives us the legal responsibilities of employers. So we can see now we're talking about employers. We're talking about the management, the senior management. Of course, let's not forget it's all about the board. And what I'm looking for in here, I'm looking for the term governance. Core actions when planning corporate governance. This is where I wanted to get to. For many organisations, health and safety is a corporate governance issue. We talk a lot about leadership, but leadership can be at any level. Governance is going to sit right at the top. It's going to sit with those people with the control in mind. Very interesting. The board should integrate health and safety into the main governance structures, including board subcommittees such as risk, remuneration and audit committees. Again, these are having the say. If we jump into the IOSH Corporate Risk Essentials course, we're now taking that right back up to the board. And an interesting area in here, one of the interesting slides in here. So the IOSH framework, the risk management framework, which includes governance, identification and assessment of risk, risk mitigation, risk monitoring and reporting, and continuous improvement. There are many other frameworks out there, ISO 31000 being just one. But if we think of the corporate governance and we go on to the next slide, risk management responsibilities, the board, the board should determine a strategic approach to risk and set the risk appetite. Remember, an ap appetite is not for the entire organization. Appetite can be set at relevant areas within the organization, even for certain projects. Establish the structure for risk management. So important. When I'm working with companies, I really want structure to be at the top, but flowing down to the bottom. So we have a bottom-up and a top-down approach. Risk management workshops on the ground. Hazard identification workshops on the ground involving those frontline, first-line operatives, supervisors, and managers. They are the owners of the risk at that point. Even if the organization itself hasn't done what it's supposed to right at the top and hasn't established that structures for risk management, I'm certain I know I know my history, I know where I've been um, in my career, and when I've been on that front line and I've needed to say stop, I've said stop. And that's not blaming, I'm not saying that everybody has got the same mindset, it's, it's just my mindset. So important, structuring that all the way through. We'll come on a little bit more about to governance in a little while. Let's have a look at some, like some cases where it's gone wrong. Baldwin's crane hire failures killed the driver in, in Edenfield. This was terrible. This was all to do about the maintenance of wagons. This is 2015. 
A crane company, that's the company, this is why it's corporate manslaughter, has been found guilty of causing a brake failure that killed one of its employees. Was that an isolated incident? Absolutely not. When you look for when you look forward a little only a little bit further down the line, Crane Hire Firm loses its license for falsifying records. Same firm, different time. Baldwin's Crane Hire has lost its vehicle licenses after it was found drivers had falsified their records. When you look a little bit deeper into this, there's absolutely a lot of falsification of records. But the drivers themselves were saying they were getting told to do it. The firm was in the spotlight last year after the death of a driver in East Lancashire. In December 2015, Baldwin's Crane Hire was found guilty of corporate manslaughter. Remembering... That's the organisation, not the individual. And I, I remember this one really clearly. I was working down in London in and around this time. Boss jailed over Knightsbridge balcony fall deaths. So here we can see, we can see the construction boss. He was jailed for shocking failures. Listening back to what Alexandra Dobson was saying when she said it's quite a difficult area, there's only been around 30 convictions since 2007. It's very difficult when we think of that patchwork quilt of responsibility in large organisations to pin down to pin down who who is at fault. However, when we come down to small organisations, when we come all the way down a little bit smaller, then it becomes a little bit more clear. And these is terrible, absolutely terrible. To save on money, um, rather than getting a purpose-built hoist, um, the gentlemen here were actually using ropes to pull a sofa over a balcony when the balcony gave way. Nottingham Care Home boss jailed for manslaughter. Actually, he was jailed, but also the firm Sherwood Rise was fined 300000 for corporate manslaughter. The first of its kind in England for that case. So as we can see, we can actually get the individuals prosecuted and the firm as well. Where does governance? Where does governance come into it? ISO 45001. Let's look for that word. We look through it and it comes up in the A section of the standard. But governance, I just want to show you something here, how these standards overlap. So the context of the organization, we're looking at external, we're looking at internal. Let's get to internal, internal issues such as governance, organizational structure, roles and responsibilities. Us on the front line can't do this. That structure needs to be put in there. If we jump over to ISO 31000 risk management guidelines, we're going to see the same thing. So, ISO 31000. If we click down into the table of contents, we have the principles, the framework, and the process. What we're going to look at is the actual framework and the leadership and commitment. Let's jump into the framework. The purpose of risk management of the risk management framework is to assist the organization in integrating risk management into significant activities and functions. That's what the framework does. It's like the framework of a tent. We have integration, design, implementation, and we have implementation and we have evaluation and improvement. Here we go. The effectiveness of risk management as in any organization, will depend on its integration into the governance of the organization, including decision-making. This requires support from stakeholders and particularly top management. Jump down into the design, go in a little bit deeper, integration, and here we go, design. When designing the framework for managing risk, the organization should examine and understand this external and internal context. We've just said that. On doing so, examining the organization internal and context may include, is not limited, vision, missions, values, governance, organization structure. There it goes again, roles and responsibility. So governance is key. This document here... Um, I put into organizations and it follows the Institute of Internal Auditors, Auditors um, the three lines of defense, which got updated this year to the three lines model. But let's have a look at the three lines model as it is here. Governing body sitting at the top. We have some key principles 
um, sorry, key principles underneath, and then we have the roles in this three lines model. So if we think about the governing body sat at the top, they're accountable to stakeholders for organisation and oversight. That feeds down, but also feeds up. When it feeds down into management, we've got the first line roles and we've got the second line roles. Well, the governing body, they are, as we've just said, responsible for developing and designing the framework for implementing risk management. So if the governing body does not even have oversight of risk registers, does not understand what's situated within them, has not set any risk appetite, is not responsive, does not accept accountability, does not nurture a culture of risk management, then we're not going to get it inside the organization. So the governing body, we've also got management, front management, sorry, front and second line roles. And then we've got the independent area of internal audit. So important. Have a look at the three lines model. So that's it. C is corporate manslaughter. So that's it. It's simple, really. The knowledge we have and the decisions we make really can help keep people safe. Today's letter was C and the subject was corporate manslaughter.